back to my channel, True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If it's your first time here and you like crime, you like consistency, you like lots of true crime content, then this is the channel for you. Please subscribe and notify yourself by hitting that notifications button so you'll never miss any of my content at all. Give me a comment, give me a like. Also, if you've never joined me for a live premiere when I showcase the video that I've done the week I've done it, it's really worth joining for one because my community is ace. Like, it's so chatty and so friendly and so supportive. So if you've never done that before, if you've never tried out a premiere with me, why don't you do it? I would suggest you do. Also, I've got a Patreon account if you fancy supporting me making content, but there is no pressure. It still surprises me that people give me money to do that, but I do try to update it with interesting bits and bobs very regularly so that there are additional benefits to following me there. Tonight's true crime is, as ever, going to be relatively gory. It is a deep dive into a horrific carjacking that took place, and hopefully I'm gonna do the victims justice. It is always in my mind that if a member of the family of one of the victims came across my channel because they got an alert about it or somebody told them about it, I would want them to feel that I had diligently looked after the legacy of their loved one. So the reason that I do go into such depth a lot of the time is because I want to do them justice. I think that most victims have already had enough injustice in their life and they don't need me adding to it. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. This offense took place on the 6th of January, 2007. It happened in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is obviously the US of A. The defendants who were involved in these murders were 24-year-old Latalvis D. Cobbins, 25-year-old Lamarcius D. Davidson, which is Cobbins' half-brother, just for the record, 23-year-old George Thomas, who was a mate of Cobbins, 34-year-old Eric Boyd, and 18-year-old Vanessa Coleman, Cobbins' girlfriend. And the victims that I'm gonna be talking about are 21-year-old Shannon Christian and 23-year-old Christopher Newsom. When I talk about Shannon and Christopher, I think you're all gonna understand what a loss it was, both to their families and to their communities, that these individuals ended up meeting the doom that they met because they were really lovely human beings. Shannon was born on the 29th of April, 1985 in Texas. She had an older brother called Chase. And I've watched a family interviewed about who she was, her personality, and they adored her. She was one of those individuals who was known to be really, truly loving. Her parents said, you know, she wasn't perfect, but certainly when you want to design a child, she would still nonetheless be considered perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does things that aren't always 100% of the time, absolutely as they should be done. But she came close. It's as simple as that. Her friends described her as an absolute delight really kind, really loyal, hugely empathic. She was very beautiful. You'll see that by the pictures that I'm putting up, but she was also really clever. So she was a really smart cookie. And when you think about that, she was literally the full package. At the time of her death, she was just nearing the end of her sociology major. So she was also about to really present something positive to the world. Christopher was born on the 21st of September, 1983 excellent baseball player. He was a former high school baseball player. He's a really skilled at it, but unfortunately he did have an injury that meant that he couldn't continue it. Nonetheless, he just seemed to have a really great capacity with his hands, whether that was throwing a ball, catching a ball. And he was a really skilled craftsman and he used to do artistic craft work with wood. So just very talented. He was also a really late addition to the family. His parents already had grown up children when he was born. So he was super special because of the fact that they'd expected their child rearing days were over when he arrived. And that doesn't make his loss any more painful than anybody else's loss. But I almost think that when you have that baby in the family, you treat them as such throughout their life. And he was a surprise. So he had that extra je ne sais quoi when it came to parenting him, that he was not expected to be born. And when he was born, they just embraced him fully. He loved sports, all sports, 
And as I mentioned, unfortunately, his potential baseball career did get cut short because of an injury. But as I've said, because he was so good with his hands, he was able to just do artwork and artistic wood creations. So really, really skilled. Now, Christopher and Shannon had been dating for about two months when this crime occurred. They'd met through mutual friends in 2006. And Christopher had just got to that stage where he'd introduced Shannon to his parents. You all know what that's like. It means you're serious, doesn't it? You know when you connect with somebody and you meet them and you're at that point where you're going to take that step, which is really nerve-wracking, and you're going to kind of introduce them to people that have meaning to you. Christopher had just done that with Shannon. And I imagine he'd done that because in that moment he was thinking this girl could be the one. I mean, she was stunning. And together they made a really beautiful couple. And just taking yourself to that moment, if you think back to how it is when you're young and you're falling in love and everything's about potential, and then you make that really scary step of introducing your new partner to your parents, it says something significant. And it's important because the deaths that they meet are gruesome and horrible, but the love that they shared in the months leading to their deaths was intense and very, very real. So they died fully in love with each other. And that doesn't make their deaths easier, but it means that in the moments that they took their last breaths, they had this deep connection of meaning and I hope that wherever they are in the big beautiful beyond, they got to continue that relationship. On Saturday the 6th of January 2007, they're basically planning to go to a friend's birthday party in the evening. So like most young people, they're excited, they're gonna go and have fun, and they're at that point in their relationship where whilst they like partying, they prefer spending a lot of time together as well. So before they were gonna to go to that party, they decide that they're gonna go on a dinner date. Remember what that feels like? when you've just got eyes for each other. And even though there's lots of fun to be had around you, it really doesn't matter where you are as long as you're next to the person that you're falling in love with. The afternoon that the crime occurred, Shannon had gone to a friend's apartment at Washington Ridge Apartments, basically to just get herself done up for the party. Obviously, we can look back at those days. I haven't done that for a very long time. Got ready for a party. I haven't been to a party, probably for a decade, but I do remember the fun and the high chinks as we would drink alcohol and do makeup and wear things like frosted pink lipstick because I come from that era. But that was what he did, wasn't it? It was exciting. Christopher, on the other hand, he'd been playing golf with friends. Totally normal day in these two young people's lives. Around 8 p.m., Channon's friend decides that she's gonna go to the party, but Channon waits behind for Christopher because they wanna go out and eat. Whilst Shannon's waiting at the apartment for Christopher, he actually drops his friend off at the same party around 9 p.m. And he says, you know, they'll be back after they've eaten. So, obviously, Chris and Shannon are gonna go and get some food and head to the party later on. Friends are all happy with that. Everyone's excited. But Chris and Shannon never arrive. They never show up. And their friends would never ever see or speak to them again. The witnesses who last saw Channon alive say that she was last seen wearing jeans, hot pink high heels, a navy blue hot pink and white striped sweater, and she was basically carrying a grey purse. The last witnesses who saw Christopher said he was wearing jeans, black and silver trainers, a blue sweater with a white collar and a baseball cap. That was the last time that they were seen alive. They meet up in the car park of the apartment complex that Channon's been waiting for him at, Obviously, this is all planned. Everything is going ahead as it's meant to. But genuinely, guys, this becomes wrong place, wrong time. And that is absolutely the beginning, middle and end of this case. Because it could have been anyone. Whoever was in that car park at that moment could have become the victims Unfortunately for Shannon and Christopher, it was them. So at some time between about 10 past 9 and 11 p.m. on the evening of the 6th of January, they are spotted in the car by a group of incredibly, in my opinion, dangerous, deviant individuals. Those individuals are looking to steal a car. So at this moment in time, Shannon is sat behind the wheel of her vehicle. It's a Toyota SUV. Christopher was standing in the doorway. 
they get approached and they're approached by a group of armed young people. Now, one of the group would later say that the reason that they went to try to get that vehicle was because drug dealers were after them, right? So they're saying that they need that car to get away. And if that were the case, that would still be a really serious crime. Carjacking is illegal and carries a pretty hefty sentence in the States. But if that had been the crime, arguably, I would say it's forgivable. People take the car, leave you alone, you got to claim on your insurance, it's a hassle, you're definitely not going to get to the party with your friends, but it's forgivable, right? Shit happens. But that's not what takes place in this case. In fact, what happens is far more sinister for a group of people who allegedly just need a car. Now, the group's ringleader in this case had previous when it came to carjacking. He's 25-year-old Lemuracius D. Davidson. He'd basically just got out of jail. He'd completed a five-year sentence in August 2006 for a previous carjacking and an aggravated robbery conviction. And I would imagine those years in prison have done little to increase the positivity in his nature. Obviously, we're looking at somebody who potentially is a career criminal at this point. He basically moved to Knoxville from prison so he could deal drugs. He didn't have a job. He didn't have a vehicle. In fact, truth was, he used to support himself by selling drugs, was known to be quite a heavy drug user, a lot of cocaine, smoked a lot of weed, obviously. I'm not suggesting for you recreational drug users out there that if you snort coke and you smoke weed, you're going to go and carjack and murder people. I'm just saying he was somebody who was not necessarily hanging around the right places with the right people with the right background. And he certainly was an individual who had a severe criminal history. Now, he wasn't alone at this moment in time. There was another member of the group, 24-year-old Latalvis D. Cobbins, that's Davidson's half-brother. Also 23-year-old George Thomas, that's Cobbins' mate also and Vanessa Coleman, who's Cobbin's 18-year-old girlfriend. Now this group go to the car where Christopher and Shannon are, and apparently at the moment that they carjack them, they're both embracing. It's the way you are, isn't it? They've not seen each other for a few hours. That's how it is when you're young and in love. You're just desperate to be with that person, and it's that point where whenever you see them, you just want to kiss the face off, isn't it? So there they are in a vulnerable moment, just excited to see each other, just about to go and get some food before they go to a party to see the mates. Can you imagine the shock when all of a sudden they are carjacked at gunpoint and they're both forced into the back of Channon's car? Now, bear in mind what we've been told about this by those assailants who actually took part in this crime. They were suggesting that they were carjacking because they were trying to escape from people who were drug dealers. So why then did they tie Channon and Christopher's hands behind their backs? Why did they blindfold them? Why did they drive them to Davidson's house? Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Now, I can accept that it could be any couple. This could have happened to any couple in that parking lot. But I won't accept that this was about getting away from drug dealers. Why would you kidnap two innocent kids and take them to your home? Why would they do that? So Davidson's house is basically a rental home. It's 2316 Chipman Street, Knoxville, and looks like a really ordinary place. You know when you kind of look at pictures of homes and you think, yeah, I could imagine horrible things happening there. You don't. It just looks like a semi-modern place in the States. It doesn't stand out. But the things that go on in that home really are so brutal that in the end, the locals had it knocked down. It was a stain in the local area so deep, so profound, that they bulldoze it in the end. And that just kind of indicates, doesn't it, the gravity of the crime that I'm going to talk about. Once they're there, they rape Christopher. And they don't just rape him using their penises, they rape him with an object. We know that he was raped by at least one of the defendants. We don't know what else happened to him during that period, but undoubtedly he was raped 
and he was also raped with an object that caused damage. When the police actually take them into custody, there's loads of contradictory statements. They are just blaming one another. What is it about criminals doing that? It's like they're all so loyal and they've got this code and they're never gonna grasp on each other and they like get arrested and like, it was him, it was her, it wasn't me. It's just always the way. And you just wanna go, hmm, he thought about the crime scene and witnesses and stuff that you might have of the victims that might just pin you all to it, but no. They just basically scream about how the others are all to blame. Just shows you what a code of loyalty these friends have. Anyway, during this period of time, it seems that after Christopher has been raped, we're not sure exactly of the timeline, he's taken from the house. Imagine what was going through his head. An hour ago, two hours ago, he's an ordinary kid going to a party, taking his girlfriend out for food, madly in love. The next minute, he is being physically violated in a way that he could never have imagined possible. And now, his girlfriend and he are being separated. The fear, the terror, and the pain that he would be going through, knowing that he's being led away, I mean, given what already has happened, you can't imagine, can you, what terror would be going on? What he must have been thinking was gonna happen next. Because already the unthinkables occurred. So these men leading him from the home, what's gonna be going through his mind? At this point, Channon is kept in the house by Vanessa Coleman. Now, I appreciate that woman, that 18 year old, did not participate in the rapes, but the fact that she kept Channon in unlawful captivity, not only prolonging the psychological terror, but ensuring that Channon didn't get away, that makes her fully complicit. She had an opportunity in that moment to call 911, to let Channon go to do something to stop this situation unraveling how it is to unravel. So I give very little empathy or understanding to Vanessa Coleman's position in this situation. She could have left. She could have let Channon leave. It seems when they've pieced this together that Christopher is basically led barefoot along a railway track. He's got a dog leash around his neck. He's wearing just a shirt and his underwear. He's blindfolded with a bandana, gagged, and his hands and feet are tied. They then shoot him twice, once in the right side of his neck, once in his back. But he's still very much alive at this moment in time. So even though they've shot him twice, and now he knows what's coming, that's the bit that really gets me. The fact that he is in no doubt. He's injured, but not mortally and he knows what's coming. And they deliver that fatal shot to his head. Complete execution star killing. This kid's done nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. How has it gone from him taking his girlfriend on a date to being dead on railway tracks? Now, a resident of Chipman Street would later testify in court that he heard three pretty fairly evenly spaced pops coming from the direction of the train tracks about 1.45 a.m. on Sunday morning. So we can imagine that that's about the amount of time that Christopher endured being kept hostage before he was murdered. They then take a comforter, wrap it around his body, douse it in gasoline and just set him alight. It's very hard to imagine that there's any silver lining in this horrific murder, but the only one I can draw is that the shot through the head killed him. So he was definitely dead by the time they set him alight. And that is very small comfort, but at least we know that he didn't burn to death as well. All this time, Channon is with Vanessa Coleman, being kept hostage, knowing that her boyfriend has been taken 
I imagine that Chana knew that he wasn't coming back. How had she been feeling? The psychological distress. I imagine she was begging Vanessa Coleman for her life. I imagine that she was crying and pleading. I imagine that she thought in those moments that that would be the one opportunity, that if she could convince a woman to let her go, then that she had hope. Can you imagine the fear when she heard them return? And not just heard them return, but that Christopher wasn't with them. I don't doubt for one minute that Chana knew he was dead. And I also imagine that Chana knew that that meant that she too was gonna die at some point. She knew too much, she'd seen too much. If he was dead, she'd be able to identify them and so on and so forth. So imagine the knowledge. They immediately start subjecting her to hours and hours of sexual torture. She's repeatedly raped, she's repeatedly beaten. As they did with Christopher, they used foreign objects to violate her. They believe that she was kept hostage for about 36 hours. Just the idea of 36 hours in that hell. It's terrific. When the autopsy was looked at, it revealed that her injuries were absolutely horrific. Really severe injuries to her vagina, her anus, her mouth, because of the force and frequency of the constant sexual abuse. The defendants were later to talk about the fact that she was tied to a chair. She was forced to perform oral sex on Davidson and Cobbins. She was repeatedly beaten, kicked in the vagina, kicked in the head. She suffered a lot of hemorrhaging and carpet burns pretty much all over her body because she was being dragged around during this period of time. And during this, she repeatedly said, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Because the abusers and the perpetrators knew about DNA, they weren't too clever. They, in their heads, had an idea of how you could destroy DNA, but they weren't very bright individuals, per se. So they decided that the way that they do it was to basically scrub her body, including her shredded genitals, with bleach. They even poured it down her throat very rudimentary way of trying to remove evidence, but you can understand why they did it. She's alive. Imagine the pain, the torture that that would cause. Imagine being forced to drink bleach. And at some point, again, we don't know when. We know it didn't kill her, but at some point Davidson breaks her neck. Finally, she is hogtied. They put plastic bags on her head. She's put into garbage bags and then she is literally shoved into a large plastic bin. She was still alive. She was still alive when they threw her away like a piece of garbage. She slowly suffocated to death. So an autopsy later confirmed that the way she was tied was what killed her. She couldn't basically breathe and also she couldn't get out of the bin. So the cause of death was recorded as positional asphyxiation, which means a position that prevents them from breathing adequately. I can't imagine how slow and painful that death would be. Bear in mind the brutality that she'd been through. The final details of the autopsy were very clear. It said that Channon had been bound with her head, neck and shoulder twisted and pressed against the bent knees. Her left cheek was pressed tightly against her knee. So a piece of curtain had been tied around her ankles and her neck. Then there was some fabric that had been tied around her thighs, which had brought them right up to her chest, you know. So imagine them being tied really tightly against her chest. Then they put a white plastic bag over her head, but that had also covered her mouth and nose, obviously, and they'd knotted that at the back to keep it in place. So you can imagine, can't you, how little air would be getting in. They then wrapped her body in five black plastic garbage bags and then they put her in a large plastic bin. So imagine how little air would be getting in. They can't tell us 
how long it took for her to die, they can't. But the coroner said it would be between 10 minutes and 30 minutes. One minute would be hell. 10 minutes and 30 minutes. Shocking, isn't it? Just thrown in a bin in the kitchen of that house. Seriously, that's what they did. They don't dispose of her body anywhere else. They just leave her in a bin in the kitchen. Now, whilst Channon is potentially slowly suffocating, Davidson actually leaves his house in Channon's SUV. If that's not bad enough, he's wearing Christopher's tennis shoes. I mean, the arrogance. He's driving the SUV of the girl he's just put in a bin in his kitchen and he's wearing the tennis shoes of the boy he's just murdered. And he's not even in shock. He's not struggling with this. In fact, after he leaves, he's trying to contact his on-off girlfriend. She's called Daphne Sutton. They'd recently broken up. She'd moved out the day after Christmas, the previous. She's basically seen other guys at the time, but they had this kind of on-off relationship. So he's getting on with his life. Think about that. He's just going about his business. Simultaneous to this, we have a completely different story. Channon and Christopher's mates, they're all at the party and they can't contact them. They've been expecting them. They're angry, they're pissed off. They don't understand why they haven't arrived. They're texting them, they're calling them, still don't get any reply. They know this is unusual. Okay, it's completely acceptable for a couple to go and do something without their mates. Maybe they'd had a meal, carried on partying somewhere else, or just gone and spent some time together alone, but not responding to them, that was not like the couple. So around 11 p.m., two of the friends go out to search for them and they find Christopher's truck in the apartment complex car park. But they can't find Channon's SUV. Understandably, the following day, that's January the 7th, they're really worried. And Channon's disappearance, even though her parents aren't aware of it at this moment in time, because remember, these are young adults. They do have time away, they do see their friends, they had been to a party as far as their parents were concerned, so they weren't having any red flags at this moment in time, only their friends have realised that something strange is happening. But when the manager of the shoe department where Channon works calls her mother to say where is she, she's not turned up for work, then massive alarm bells start to ring. She's never missed a day of work and the family are instantly deeply concerned. Now Challen's mum is trying to contact her on the phone, can't get through to her, so she starts to ring around Christopher's family and all of Challen's friends, even local hospitals, all the things that you do when somebody goes missing, but no one's seen them. So at this point, now she can't get in contact with her daughter and no one knows where the couple are. She contacts Knox County Sheriff's Department, she files a missing persons report. Christopher's family hadn't even realised he was missing. He told them that he'd be staying with a friend. Remember, he's a little bit older, so it was completely normal for him to come and go as he pleased. I have to tell you, local law enforcement were crap. Absolutely crap at the beginning of this search. Genuinely. They said, as far as they were concerned, Channon and Christopher are adults. They're allowed to go missing. I understand that some people go missing. I understand that some people want to go missing. I understand that young adults have a right to do things the way that they want to do things. I appreciate all of this is true. But when somebody acts completely out of character, when it goes against their normal behavior patterns, it is a red flag. And if family and friends are saying something has gone wrong, something is worrying, she hasn't turned in for work, this is out of character, it should be taken as read that it is serious. Remember, Channon is kept for a long period of time in that bin. It's important that when we know somebody has gone missing, 
we are applying the right amount of resources to bring that person home. But essentially they're told, you need to go and search for them yourselves. So basically that's what they do. The parents have to become the lead investigators in the disappearance of their own children. They're clever. They get in contact with Channon's mobile phone provider because they want to know, okay, where was she? And that means that they're able to locate the area that Channon's phone was last used. And they find out that it's last pinged off the Cherry Street phone tower. So they go to that area and they carry out a street by street search of the area. This is how profoundly important these children are to those people. The friends and family taking it on themselves because they know something serious has gone wrong. It wasn't an area either that Christopher or Channon frequented. So that in itself was concerning because they would expect certain patterns of behavior. We know that, that's why forensics and profilers analyze things this way. We look at patterns to note whether it's within the normal type of behavior. That usually tells us whether we should be worried or otherwise, right? Now, deeply disturbingly, they do find Channon's SUV in the early hours of the 8th of January. It's on the corner of Chipman and Glider Street. That's just two blocks from Davidson's house. At this point, finally, the police are called and they respond to the scene. Now, the moment that they look at the car, it is absolutely obvious that Channon has not been driving it. Why? Because the driver's seat has been pushed back because the person driving must have been much bigger. In fact, both of the front seats were pushed fully back. That indicates likely males, likely relatively tall. Aside from the seats having been pushed back, they'd also tried to change the look of the car a little bit. They'd removed the uh, University of Tennessee and a North Face sticker that had been in the back window. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, my God, that's incredible. I mean, that disguises the car fully. Nobody would imagine that car that looked exactly like Channon's car with exactly the same number plate, but it doesn't have the sticker in the back window, so we'll definitely not believe that's hers. We are dealing with criminals on this level of sophistication right now. Horribly evil, nasty actions, but not too clever, if that makes sense. Also, they noticed that quite a lot of the personal possessions that would be in Shannon's car weren't there. So her phone wasn't there, charger wasn't there, the teddy bear that she used to have in the car, an overnight bag and personal photos had disappeared. It was also noted that Channon's a really clean person and the floorboards were covered with mud. So this is not looking good. They can assume in this moment in time that Channon has not been involved with that car for a certain period of time. Also a significant item is that there's a crumble packet of cigarettes found in the back of the vehicle. Christopher and Channon didn't smoke. Also, it was clear that somebody had tried to clean the exterior of the vehicle. It had been wiped clean, but there was a bank envelope that was on the back seat and it contained a latent fingerprint, which is really handy when you're trying to figure out whether somebody has stolen a car, right? And they did. It proved that it was a match for Davidson. After they've analyzed this fingerprint and realized it's Davidson, they search for where he is and they realize that he lives nearby on Chipman Street. Also, very conveniently, they realise that there's an outstanding warrant for his arrest. He's not appeared in court. So that means that they can obviously get a warrant and also arrest him because he's not been in court at a time when he should have been. So on the 9th of January, they go to his address. Now it's empty at this point. It takes them five minutes within that place to discover Challen's body. In fact, Sergeant Keith DeBow went in, noticed this really odd large bin felt like it looked like a bit of a strange shape and genuinely in that moment he thought that somebody was hiding in it he thought somebody was potentially in there about to jump out or was at least trying to hide from the police he gets his weapon draws it thinks it is going to potentially be in danger lifts the lid and then obviously he sees an arm partially covered in fabric which is Channon's arm when he talks about discovering Channon's body, he recounts how she looked like she was in a really forced fetal position. He saw that her thighs had been bound to her chest and her ankles were bound with strips of bedding and that her head had been unnaturally forced down onto her knees. He also said that she was naked from the waist down. It's hard to imagine what that police officer would have been feeling in that moment, isn't it? 
Maybe he thought that Davidson was hidden there. Obviously he was worried for his own life. And then all of a sudden he's confronted by this beautiful young woman, so horrifically disfigured and broken. Basically broken. Her neck had been broken. She was forced into that small space. It must have been horrifying. The coroner also said when they looked at the extensive injuries, not just the ones that killed her, that her lip to her gum was torn. She had loads of bruising and abrasions around her mouth. And you can imagine why. You can imagine what was being forced into her mouth. She had horrific damage to her private areas. Horrific. Bruises, lacerations, contusions, swellings. In fact, the bruising was so severe that it created this solid blood clot under the entire private area. It was so extreme when they looked at the injuries that they said that they must have used blunt objects on her as well. She had loads of bruising on the backs of her arms, loads of bruising on the sides of her head. That had in itself caused loads of hemorrhaging. So she had been horrifically tortured over a long period of time before she died. They found loads of the couple's possessions in the property. These guys weren't organised killers. They had Christopher's driving licence, baseball caps, one that he'd actually just been seen wearing. They also had like a payslip from Channon's work. They had Channon's purse there. And when they did fingerprint analysis on that, Davidson's prints were on them. So it was clearly linking him to the murders. Whilst the officers were looking around at Davidson's property, they also found Channon's iPod. I don't know whether any of you remember, but iPods are the ones where you could store your music and you used to be able to get them personalised. So I had mine personalised to my kids. And this one said, Channon Christian, mum and dad, we love you. Isn't that just awful? You can't imagine how that present that personalised present that would have brought so much joy to Shannon ended up in that man's room after the torture that she endured. Just those moments that connect time and space, isn't it? You can imagine her opening it and being thrilled because she got the iPod and it had that little inscription on and then realising that it ended up in that place, in that home with that man, just chilling. So now the police know that they're looking at least for Davidson, but I would imagine they would appreciate at this moment in time that there are accomplices because of the fact that they found Shannon's car, they can see that there was more than one person in it, but clearly at this moment in time, they haven't got the culprits. So now the police have a body and they are obviously assuming at this moment in time that this is Shannon's, but they haven't got Christopher. At this moment in time, Christopher is still a missing person, but not for long. Because on the 7th of January, a railroad employee basically found Christopher's civilly burned body just on the side of the track. Police are called and they pretty quickly established that that's Christopher's smouldering remains and they were still smouldering. And even though the body was still smouldering, they could tell that Christopher had been tied up. They also could tell that he'd had a sock pushed into his mouth and they'd basically tied a shoelace around his head to keep the gag in place so he wouldn't have been able to scream or shout. His head and his face had also been wrapped in a sweatshirt and they could see bullet wounds through his body. It's utterly horrific to imagine that execution because that's what it was. It was an execution. Now the problem with Christopher's body is that obviously we know that fire really does destroy DNA. So they had done a good job of that externally. It was very difficult to get any DNA from them. However, because of the sexual abuse, they were able to get evidence of semen from his body. The autopsy that came back on Christopher was equally as horrific as what happened to his girlfriend. He had been anally raped about two hours before he died. He had really significant injuries to his anal and genital area, had lacerations, tearing, a lot of bruising. He'd been shot three times. And as you know, the report also showed that he'd been shot three times. The coroner explained the way he'd been shot was from behind. The first shot had gone between his neck and shoulder. The second shot had gone down through his lower back. But it sounds like the reason it did that was he was bending down at the time. 
totally severed his spinal cord and then they shot him through the head. So right next to his head as well. So they'd gone right up to him, just above his ear and executed him. That severed his brain stem straight away, caused instantaneous death, which I imagine at that moment in time probably was something that he was grateful for. And as you know, they then completely desecrated and decimated his body by burning him. And one of the things that really sticks with me is when I watched a documentary with his parents, his parents said we were relegated to embracing a body bag as our farewell to our son. That is something that's so poignant and I think that any parent will understand that feeling. The idea that you don't get to hold your child for one last time, the idea that you don't get to kiss their forehead goodbye, they're things that are hugely painful. That adds insult to injury when it comes down to child death. It really does. So now the police have found Christopher. They know he's been set on fire and they also can now track back that whilst they were at the house of Davidson, they also found a gasoline can. So they are very aware that Davidson is involved in these two young people's murders. So sadly, now the police know that they're dealing with a double homicide and they also know that Davidson is the individual who's implicated. Now let's just go back a little bit. Do you remember what I said earlier on? When Davidson had dumped Channon's body in that bin, that he just seemed to go out and get on with his business, right? And how strange that is. So just imagine the psychology of Davidson right now, the kind of human being who can just murder two innocent people and then be so egocentric and concerned about his own life that he leaves just after he's put her in that horrible bin and then goes and calls his ex on off girlfriend. Where is his mindset? Think about that. Think about how you should be feeling if you'd just done that. He's just executed two human beings and he's just getting on with his day, trying to sort things out with his ex. So when Davidson actually speaks to Daphne, she's really wanting to get her possessions back. You know, she's left things at his place. She wants them back. She's seen other guys now. The relationship is on and off. She clearly wants to reclaim whatever is at his home. He says to her, okay, you can come around, but you're gonna have to wait 30 minutes. And that is like a red rag to a bull. You know how it is, girls, when you think a guy's got another woman and maybe they've been on and off with you and you want to discover them in a compromising position so that you can prove what a low life they are and that's exactly what she wants to do so she goes straight over he's like wait 30 minutes and she's like forget that i'm going to go around straight away and i'm going to confront him so off she goes but even though he's there with cobbins and thomas and to all intents and purposes there isn't a woman in the property they won't let her in it's as simple as that She's saying, I want to get my makeup bag, but she's told, no, somebody's in there. You can't go in there. They basically said that Vanessa Coleman was in there. But she is really, really persistent and really wants to get her stuff. Now, looking back, it's very likely that Channon was actually being held in the bathroom at the time. Just a sliding doors moment, isn't it? If she had managed to get entry to there, that could have all have ended. Instead, she was prevented from entering the bathroom. So she was stopped by Davidson. Now he then tries to give her items that don't basically belong to her and he also gives her some cash. She refuses the money, but she takes the bag thinking that it's her stuff. She gets back home, she looks in the bag and she's like, these are not my things. In that bag, there's a red skirt, a pink blouse, a pair of glow jeans and a ring. Every single one of those turned out to be one of Channon's possessions. So not only has he murdered this poor innocent girl, he has taken her clothes and possessions and given them to his ex. And Daphne Sutton is really irate about that. She actually gives the jeans to a friend, but then she calls Davidson and is like, come and collect this crap. And he turns up to collect it in Channon's SUV. Now, the next time that Daphne Sutton hears from Davidson is later on that day. He basically has this ruse that has been locked out of his house. We all know what's really happening, but she doesn't. So we know the police are onto him, right? But as far as she's concerned, this on-off guy that she's still kind of in a relationship with a bit is asking her for some help. So she lets him come round. 
and he stays with her at one of her friend's apartments until the 9th of January. At that point, Daphne Sutton gets a call from her mother. And her mother says to her, a girl's body has been found in your on-off boyfriend's house. Clearly at that point, Daphne is a bit like, hmm, I did have some questions and foibles about the relationship that we were in, but now I realise that you're a pathological maniac killer, please exit my life. And he vacates. On a serious note though, genuinely, Daphne Sutton asks him to leave. Does she call the police? No, she doesn't. Instead, she just drops him off at Ridgebrook Apartments in Knoxville. What an upstanding citizen she was. Now that Davidson's been asked to leave by his on-off girlfriend, obviously he needs somewhere to stay. He's gonna be very aware that the police are after him. So he meets up again with Eric Boyd. Now Eric Boyd is one of the individuals who's been involved in this horrible crime. They stay at a friend's house. She's called Danielle Lightfoot. And it's at this point that Eric Boyd contacts a guy called Kevin Armstrong. And he basically says to Kevin Armstrong, you need to help us get away. However, the thing about friends is that just because we have a friend, it doesn't mean that they don't have a moral compass if we don't. And you see, Kevin Armstrong has heard about the body at Davidson's house. And when he arrives and sees Davidson, he realizes that Eric Boyd has some involvement and point blank, he refuses to help. Now, I personally think he should have gone a stage further and called the police, but I understand the loyalty that he probably felt to Eric Boyd, and he didn't know that Boyd had been involved in the murders. All he knows is that Davidson definitely has. So he chooses not to actually do anything with that information, but at least he doesn't help them escape. The following day, so of course, is Danielle Lightfoot has let these two guys stay at her property. She realises that the body of Channon's been found and she asks them to leave. Again, what is it about people not calling the police? Is it more preferable to have psychopathic maniacs running around the streets just willy-nilly murdering people than just to tell the police that these are the individuals that have done it and this is where they are? It really does drive me a little bit crazy because you know what makes dangerous psychopathic killers more dangerous? Desperation, that's right. So when you put them in a position where they haven't got anywhere to go, and they're violent, and they've got these incredible tendencies to do harm, the last thing that we need is them being out and desperate because they are much more likely to commit more violent crime. Just saying, kids, if you find out that somebody's killed somebody on your watch, just call the police. It saves a lot of trouble in the long term. These guys basically go and hide in Woodland. They start ringing around their contacts. They're just desperate to get out of town because they know that the police are going to get them. Around 3.30 a.m. on the 11th of January, they still haven't been able to get a ride and they break and enter this vacant house. It's on Reynolds Street. This is purely so that they can hide from police and understandably, they're probably in a quite desperate state at this moment in time. At some point, Eric Boyd leaves, goes to his mother's, and leaves Davidson, his mobile, so that they can constantly stay in contact. The way that they devise this system, because remember at this point, Davidson is the person that they're after. So at this point, Eric Boyd can go home, but they need to remain in contact. I would imagine that Davidson is hungry and thirsty and wants Eric Boyd to be able to offer them some kind of sustenance or think about a getaway plan, right? So they even organized this calling system. So if the phone goes two calls in quick succession, then Davidson knows that he can ring Boyd back. So they're very much planning this system where they both know that they're safe to communicate and that Davidson knows it's Boyd calling. And phone records actually indicate that they did use that system quite a lot. Now the police do pick up Eric Boyd on the 11th of January and they take him in for questioning. He is a person of interest shall we say, because of the people that he may be acquainted with. Now, when he goes in, they sit him down and he's like, I'm gonna tell you the absolute truth. Yes, I am responsible. 
absolutely Davidson is responsible and this is what happened. That isn't what happened at all. Obviously that did not happen at all. That is just what should happen, but never does. He basically says, I don't know. No idea where Davidson is. No idea. I haven't been hiding out at a house with him with a strange connection with our phones with a special signal. Not at all. But it doesn't take long. I imagine it didn't take long because the police were like, Eric, think clearly about this. We found everything at Davidson's house. Like the bin, the body, the belongings, the bullets, the body, the railway. We were there and there. And if you're telling us that you weren't involved, that's okay. But don't think that you can pretend that Davidson wasn't involved. So the more that you sing like a canary, the more lenient will probably be to you. At which point he was like, you know what? I've actually just remembered. Um, he's at Reynolds Street. That's where he is. It's just a classic, isn't it? doesn't take a lot for police to make it clear that they have enough evidence to bring you bang to rights and I would imagine that at this moment in time he's just thinking how do I save myself from potential execution it's going to be running through his mind isn't it how do I get away with not being killed even though when you think about what I've done there may be a good argument for me maybe getting killed just throwing it out there guys so Unsurprisingly, the police straight away, 4 p.m., get Davidson. He's found in the house, arrested. They also gather loads of evidence. So they've got Eric Boyd's mobile phone. They've got a revolver. They've got Christopher's tennis shoes, which I told you earlier on Davidson was wearing. And they're all with him. So he's not really got a chance, has he? He's not going to be able to play the, oh, I just found these card. Clearly, firstly, he's a fugitive. Secondly, he's been hiding. Most importantly, he's got items of the poor individuals that they have murdered. Unsurprisingly, Eric Boyd doesn't get away with murder. I know he's arrested later on in the afternoon because the other suspects basically tell them he's involved. Eric Boyd's involved. You know what the police do? I've been involved with police cases and situations. I'm not saying that I'm the person who's been arrested and taken in request. I have first-hand knowledge of how they do the good cop, bad cop, because when I was up for armed robbery, no, what I'm saying is I have been involved in situations where the police are very clever and they totally make you believe that the friend that hasn't said anything about you has said loads about you. They're just very good at doing it because when they've got evidence, they can make it seem that they know more than they do. And it's amazing how this psychological squeezing can really make people sing, so to speak. The police also really quickly find Thomas, Cobbins and Coleman. They fled to Kentucky. They're just desperately trying to get away, but they're arrested the same day. Like I said, we are not dealing with the brightest bunch of career criminals. That's the thing about a lot of people who've been in prison and are involved in crime. The fact that they're in prison or have been in prison suggests they're not very good at it. It's always the way I think about it. Prison full of pretty poor criminals because they got caught. I'm not saying that there's a good thing being a good criminal. I'm just saying that the bad ones are in prison and these guys have got history in prison. So we already know they're not sophisticated. Sorry for my sarcasm. I am being very judgmental towards them. But they're a bunch of horrible people, aren't they? They are arrested at a house of an acquaintance in Kentucky who understandably had no idea whatsoever that they were harboring three fugitives and they have Shannon's belongings with them. I think they deserve life just for that stupidity. I'm really glad that Shannon and Christopher's possessions were found in this way because it's much easier for the prosecution to create a really solid case but when it comes down to people like these, I don't think they're safe to boil a kettle. That kind of intelligence that they demonstrate in the way they've dealt with this situation shows you that. They have transported the individual who they've murdered, possessions, and have them with them. 
And understandably, when the police actually take items from the property where they're arrested, one of the things they find is a computer and they do a history check on it and they've been following the developments of the investigation. So they've been watching it. Again, that's very important information because why would you? Think about all the murders that happen, particularly in somewhere like the States. Unfortunately, whilst we'd like to think that murder is rare, it isn't that rare. Why would you be that interested in two white kids from a different area who've been murdered? You wouldn't be. So that in itself, again, shows suspicion. Now, one of the things that I always find really interesting is when suspects give their version of events. So shall we go through a few of the versions of events that Davidson gave? Now, bear in mind, just bear in mind what we know about this man. He'd just got out of prison for five years. He deals drugs, he takes drugs. He's also in and out of relationships, not the most reliable sort. He's somebody who's very able to carry out gratuitous violence, we know this. Also, all of the evidence that they have found at his property, all directing the murders to him. So we know this, right? When he's questioned, he just gives loads of different versions. This is not unusual. If you watch interrogations with people, they will often start by denying everything. That tends to be the go-to. Obviously, we have the no comments, which means that they're guilty as hell, but if you don't do the no comment, you do the wasn't there, nothing to do with me, I don't even know who you're talking about, it's not even my house, that kind of stuff. And this is very, very common. So first, don't know what you're talking about, had nothing to do with it, have no idea why or how all of that stuff ended up there, and I have had no responsibility whatsoever in carrying out these horrific murders. He actually said, I left my house on Friday, and I know nothing about what must have happened there. Genuinely, that's what he said. Basically, just left his house on Friday. All of this had transpired whilst he was out, and then he's in a situation where he's having to explain himself to the police as a totally innocent man. But then he starts to kind of like, oh, is that convincing? Does it sound convincing that I just didn't go there at all? Will I be able to get away with that? And this happens, people go back to the cells, have a think about it, or sometimes detectives will throw them a little line. For example, in the Chris Watts murder case where he murdered his family, it was like, was your wife horrible? Did she hurt the children? Did you kill her because she hurt the children? And then he was like, hmm, that seems more convincing than just like pretending I wasn't there. Okay, yes, I was the hero. She deserved to die. And then he went down for life. That kind of thing is what detectives do. So as he starts thinking about it, he's like, right, how do I make it so that I'm not quite as guilty? So in one version, he's like, Cobbins and Thomas arrived in, Ch I imagine this is the speed, by the way, that it came to him. Cobbins and Thomas arrived in Shannon's vehicle and said they'd carjacked some people. And Christopher and Shannon were tied up in it. And I was appalled, I was appalled. I was, I was, I was, I'm having nothing to do with that. I, I'm having, I can't believe you've done it. I am leaving. I am going to smoke weed. Literally, that was it. I'm going to smoke weed. Just went off. Smoke weed. That was, that was what he said. And then apparently he returned stoned at this point, inebriated, shall we say, and apparently Channon's been brought into his house. So now Channon's in his house, he's like, oh God, this is really serious, you know? Like, these guys have carjacked this innocent victim and taken her into my house. He also suggests that one of the main concerns that he had, in spite of the fact that he's just apparently seen two of his friends bring a girl home that's car's been carjacked and take her, against her will, into his home, He's more concerned that she's going to notice that he takes her car and goes and sells drugs in her car. So that's his concern. I know, it makes sense, doesn't it? 
Absolutely, that would be a priority concern. That this car that I'm now apparently borrowing off the people who've just brought it here, and I'm gonna go and sell drugs in, this girl can probably say that I've been selling drugs as opposed to you know, like a grade one felony where you've literally kidnapped an innocent person and they're in your home. Go with me on this one. This is why he explains he wiped his prints off the vehicle. Nothing like a criminal who's trying to think on his feet and there's not a lot going on. There were three brain cells and they were all fighting each other where this guy's concerned. He claims that the last time he's seen Shannon, because he's had nothing to do with it, she's on the bed in his home and she's saying that she didn't want to die. I do believe that he absolutely saw that happen. I do fully believe they were the words that she was saying and I believe she would have been repeating them a lot. So I think that's truth. And often in interrogations, we see truth and lies interjected. So he's telling the truth at that point. Now he says, I didn't rape her and I didn't see anyone else hurt her. He also claims that there's no way that anyone will find any DNA of his on her body because you know what? They've been watching the forensic files and a bit of CSI. And of course they think that the bleach will have got rid of DNA and he was wrong. Of course he was wrong. This is a guy who literally left the body of an innocent girl in his kitchen to suffocate whilst he went to try to sort things out with an ex. Hardly a sophisticated killer, but also hardly an individual with the conscience or intelligence to understand how transparent that kind of description of events would be. And do you know what? The jury were like, oh my God, that's really convincing. Totally, that makes absolutely perfect sense. We find you completely guilty, massively guilty, fully guilty. Didn't take very long for them to find you guilty because Davidson, you were banged to rights guilty. Rightly so. Now, when the defendants were tried, each one of them was tried separately. Davidson, Cobbins, Thomas and Boyd, they all admitted that they were inside Chipman Street and they all admitted they were there whilst the couple were basically held captive but they all said that they were completely innocent. They hadn't been involved at all. It was just that they had been witness to these poor individuals being kept there. Now, in the States, it's different in the UK, but in the States, depending on the criminal offence, you can face charges at either a state or a federal level. So Davidson, Cobbins, Thomas and Boyd were all originally charged with federal indictments but these were later dismissed in favour of state prosecutions, all aside from Boyd, because Eric Boyd actually would not be prosecuted for the rape and murders. Don't know whether you agree with that. I have a feeling that that might be because he told the police of everything they wanted to know. It does happen, doesn't it? That there'll be one in a situation who has been complicit but somehow doesn't get the same treatment. And yet the police and interrogators and prosecution do seem to have a lot of extra information about the crimes that have committed. I'm not saying that Eric Boyd did that, but I am saying that Eric Boyd definitely did that. Anyway, as I said, he was not tried for the rape and murders. Now at Davison's trial, we all have to appreciate that the defense is trying to get him off. That's their job, right? And one of the things, I'm laughing not because it's funny, but because it's bizarre that this would even be argued. He basically says that he doesn't want the autopsy photos bringing it in. He says that they're too graphic, disturbing, horrifying, gruesome, and that basically they aren't that important. No, they're not important. It's not important to actually see the horror that poor girl went through, that poor guy went through. No, we should save the jury from the reality of the case that we're trying. Can you see where we're going with this? Like, that's a really important thing to want to change, isn't it? If you can stop the jury from actually fundamentally witnessing the horror, then to some degree you can lessen the impact of the reality of those murders. And this defence argued that the evidential value was outweighed by their prejudicial effects and would inflame the jury against Davidson. I'm not laughing, obviously, about the murder. I'm saying, damn straight, that's what it's meant to do. That's, sorry, Mr. Defence Attorney, can we just have a word? 
The reason that we want as the prosecution to enter these pictures that are gruesome, horrifying and horrific in your words is so we inflame the jury to find your defendant guilty. Anyway, fortunately, he was unsuccessful in this argument. Davidson, Thomas and Cobbins, they each faced 46 charges. That's 16 counts of felony murder that related to the rape, robbery and kidnapping. Two counts of premeditated murder. Obviously, even though the time scale wasn't huge, it was very premeditated. You don't go and execute somebody unless it's premeditated. You don't torture, break the neck of, suffocate an individual unless it's premeditated. They were not defensible. These were clearly planned to a degree. They were also tried for two counts of especially aggravated robbery. Now that is a specific condition where the crime itself has taken place, but they didn't need to use the level of force. So let's say the carjacking. A carjacking, it would be enough, wouldn't it, to say, get out of your car. Okay, you might have a gun, but the people will exit the car. And even though that's a horrible crime, the point is those individuals are left safely. When it's especially aggravated, it means that the use of force was way outside the realms of requirement. And there was also four counts of especially aggravated kidnapping again. As you know, the way that they tied them up then brutalized them, that kind of kidnapping was completely unnecessary. Even tying them up was not necessary. They had a weapon. So especially aggravated fits there. And there was 20 counts of aggravated rape and two counts of theft. 20 counts of aggravated rapes. Awful. Cobbins was found guilty of Channon and Christopher's murders. He got life without parole, rightly so. Davidson... He was sentenced in October 2009. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Death, Davidson. You were sentenced to death. They didn't believe that you'd just gone off for a bit of a wander, having a bit of weed, getting a bit stoned before coming back to find a poor defenseless girl on a bed begging for her life that you then still didn't help her with. No, he got death. Now later, his defense attorney actually said that Davidson cried when you got the death penalty, mm, did you cry? It's really sad for you, isn't it? Apparently he said it was one thing to anticipate a death sentence and another to actually get it. I don't believe in the death penalty. It doesn't happen in the UK, but it, I respect that it happens in the USA. And the truth is, if you're somebody in the USA and you do something that is first degree murder that can carry the death sentence, then do I feel sorry for you when you get it? I can't, you know the law. So in the UK, I don't feel that the death sentence is appropriate and acceptable, right? I don't, I always think mistakes can be made. Believe me, it's not that I don't sometimes think that people deserve to die. I just think that just killing is a very challenging argument, okay? And I also think that an individual carrying out a just killing can be psychologically damaged. That's why when they use a firing squad, they have several different people and they don't know who's got the loaded gun because the psychological damage can be extensive. So for that reason, people getting killed who shouldn't. And secondly, the impact on the person carrying it out is why it's not for me. Do I believe in whole life tariffs? Yes, I really do. Do I believe some people in the UK who get out should stay in? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I respect that in the USA, the death penalty exists. And I respect that if you're a criminal in the USA, you know it does. So do I feel sorry for Davidson? No. He got what he legally deserved. It's as simple as that. And the fact that he cried, good, good. But I imagine he was crying for himself not for those poor, innocent, beautiful kids that he killed. Another one of the perpetrators, Thomas, he got life without parole. And Vanessa Coleman, well, she got 40 charges. So she got 12 counts of felony murder. That was related to the rape, robbery, kidnapping and theft. She got one count of premeditated murder. Now that would be in relation to Channon, because as we know, she kept Channon hostage whilst they took Christopher and executed him. So she wasn't directly involved with that murder. She was charged with one count of especially aggravated robbery. That was in relation to Christopher. We know she was part of the carjacking. Four counts of especially aggravated kidnapping. She was there. 20 counts of aggravated rape. 
it's on the balance that one isn't it because i don't think she was directly involved in it she was done with two counts of theft but because of her defense she actually did avoid a murder sentence they did convict her but they found her guilty of lesser charges she got sentenced to 53 years i think she's a reprehensible terrifying human being but i do agree that I don't think that she felt in a powerful situation there. She had a chance though to let Shannon go, so that's why I don't have any sympathy or empathy with her. It would be different if she had been in a situation where those guys hadn't given her a window of opportunity. If she had been in a situation where these big guys had basically been raping and kidnapping and harming these two innocent people and she was in the place with them, I think it would be very difficult for her to stop it, even if she wanted to. The minute she lets those guys leave with Christopher and keeps Channon against her will, she loses every piece of potential innocence in this situation. So the fact that she gets 53 years, I'm happy with, right? Now, Eric Boyd, he's a suspect from the start, but he basically insists he wasn't anywhere near Washington Ridge Apartments where the kidnapping took place or Chipman Street where the crimes occurred. He also denies any involvement in the abduction, rape and murders of Channon and Christopher. He did, however, get charged with being an accessory to a carjacking. They said that that resulted in serious bodily injury to another person also he concealed a felony right he concealed davidson and he actually got 18 years in 2008 so he didn't get off lightly so to speak do we believe that eric boyd wasn't there directly didn't see those things i don't know i would imagine that maybe some of the information that he shared was probably very helpful to the police it's just me asserting that i'm not saying it's actually true but i do think there is a marked difference between 18 years and the death penalty clearly there is something very distinct about those sentences and i have to say that the family of channon and christopher actually all believe that he was way more involved than his conviction suggested they felt that he was party to all the crimes and they still believe that he got away with murder it's as simple as that now, I don't know how any of you feel about Eric Boyd, but personally, I think he did get away with murder, and it's certainly how Channon and Christopher's family feel. I cannot for a minute imagine why he would be hanging out with Davidson, he would be trying to figure out how they could escape, he'd be having these weird phone calls with him. You know, all of these things point potentially to him definitely being involved. And quite a few witnesses did agree. You know, two different witnesses said that Boyd had been at the scene of the crime around the time of the carjacking, around the rapes and around the murders. So they actually placed him there. And also, when he was interviewed, Boyd talked about lots of intimate details that hadn't been released into the media. So he was giving information to the police. Do you remember what I said about him giving information to the police? He was giving information to the police that hadn't been put in the media. So personally, we can all agree that he must have had insider information. How would he know that stuff? I suppose you could say that it was because he had been told by the perpetrators what had happened. But nonetheless, he was certainly a serious accessory there. And the way that he acted after the offence was really questionable. Why would you hide out with a murderer when you're innocent? His home was nearby. It doesn't make any sense. Also, why would he want to help a guy who had potentially murdered two innocent individuals? Every other person who Davidson asked for help said no. Eric Boyd harboured a fugitive, helped him escape, committed a break into that vacant home and basically enabled this situation to play out. It really does make you consider the injustice, doesn't it? If this is the case, that somehow he only got 18 years for this kind of brutal murder. Now don't let what I've just said leave a sour taste in your mouth because 12 years after that sentencing, justice was served because Thomas and Cobbins both accused Eric Boyd of having been involved in Christopher's death. And that meant that Eric Boyd was tried on state charges in relation to the death of Channon and Christopher. He was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder. He was given two life sentences plus da, 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 90 extra years for the various offences because obviously there was the abductions, the rapes and the murder of the young couple. So they threw that all together and it means that he will never, ever get out and because thomas 
actually testified at his trial against Eric Boyd, he actually got his sentence reduced to 50 years. So to some degree, there is a potential that he may walk the streets again, who knows? Now, as we know, in the States, there are always appeals. Somebody gets found guilty and they appeal the sentence. We know how this plays out. But this one has some twists and turns in it. So the trial judge, Judge Baumgartner, was disbarred because apparently during the trial, he was addicted to drugs. So he's basically buying prescription pain medication from convicts. I mean, I suppose it's quite convenient. You've got a lot of drug dealers around you prescription or non-prescription. Also, he was accused of uh, trading legal favours for sex during breaks in court sessions. Can you imagine that? Just like a few people waiting to come to court. You're like in the back. Send Susie through. I've got a deal for you. Literally. That's what he was doing. So he actually went to prison for six months. Yeah, he went to a federal prison. I bet that was not pleasant. He died in 2018, actually, but can't imagine those last six months were very nice for him. I mean, when you've been a judge, you're not gonna be that popular. Mind you, you might be quite popular with some of the people that you've done favors for, who knows? And you probably still can get the drugs inside as well. Let's be honest, it is very accessible in such places. Now, because of that, understandably for the last two years they felt that his practice was impaired which meant that they had to try the cases and that meant that Coleman, Vanessa Coleman and Thomas got retrials. Can you imagine how horrific that would be for the victims families? You know you've been through this terror, horror, tragedy, loss, pain. You know traumatic losses are the worst kind of grief. They are expansive, consistent forever. It's just the way it plays out. The idea that those innocent human beings could be put through this intolerable pain again. And let's be honest, why were they being put through it? Because a system that they were meant to trust had failed them. I mean, it must have felt like society had failed them per se. Coleman goes on trial and she's convicted of lesser charges. I don't have any sympathy or empathy with this woman, but I do think there was enough doubt as far as her involvement in the actual rape and murders. So on retrial, she was convicted of aggravated kidnapping, facilitation of rape and facilitation of the murder of Channon. I think that's right. I don't think she was involved in the rapes. I don't think she was involved in the murders, but she did nothing to stop it. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, she was a facilitator and she definitely was a facilitator in the murder of Challenge. You could have set her free. So she was sentenced then to 35 years. Now, she's already been up for parole, but she was refused. And that's because they listened to the impact statements from the families. And that refusal means that she can't apply for parole again for at least 10 years, which I think the family will feel very good about. If you look at this case, there's quite a lot of controversy surrounding it as well, because a lot of people felt it was a hate crime. It was five black people killing two white people. People also suggested that because it was five black people killing two white people, that it was massively underreported. While some people believe that the case was underreported, journalists said that just wasn't true. They said that the reason that it didn't actually get the attention that people thought it deserved was because as far as they were concerned, there wasn't any racial hatred. It wasn't a crime where five black people had waited for two white people to harm them. In fact, when you looked at the friends cohort of the individuals who'd carried out the crime, they had white friends, they had white partners. So to some degree, that makes it seem that it would be less likely it was racially motivated. But others disagree, including Channon's mother. She said that as far as she's concerned, the way they treated the bodies of the victims, the way that they raped and abused and defiled Channon and Christopher, she felt came from a place of hate. And it's not for me to pass judgment on that. I think it's a really difficult one. I think we can definitely say that the way that they treated Christopher and Channon was utterly hateful, but it may be that they were quite capable of treating anybody of any ethnicity that way. 
and it's more wrong place, wrong time situation, but only the individuals who carried that out will actually know. Nonetheless, we can all agree that the heinous way that they treated them must have been down to some internalised rage and enjoying the torture and pain that they inflicted. After Channon and Christopher's murders, two new laws were actually introduced in the States and one of them is called the Chris Newson Act and the reason for that is they wanted to eliminate the need for a judge to have a signature on a jury verdict. So when a jury has created a unanimous verdict and somebody's found guilty, the judge actually has to sign it and as we can imagine, the judge in this case was not fit to sign it and that invalidated the original jury's decision, which doesn't make any sense because the jury are the people making the decision of guilt. So that changed. And the second law that's changed is called the Channon Christian Act. And this is really important. It basically restricts lawyers from making stuff up, I'd say, from just making stuff up. Because what happened is when Davidson was being defended by his lawyer, his lawyer just created this elaborate story that the reason that Christopher and Channon were at Davidson's address was because they were buying drugs. Just absolute bollocks. But it's a way of making the jury consider the victims in a different light. But if you manage to create enough reasonable doubt, you could essentially get Davidson off, couldn't you? I mean, he wouldn't have because of all the other things, but that's what his defense was trying to do. So they've stopped that being allowed, which I think is so important. And as I said at the very beginning of this, what's really compelling about this case is the way that the local community have dealt with the ramifications. They all petitioned and made sure that that house was completely demolished. And there's now a memorial that is in its place. It's somewhere that the family now know that their legacy of their children will always be remembered. Unsurprisingly, Davidson's still on death row. I mean, we all know that there are problems with death row at the moment, but what we can all be completely assured of is that Davidson will never ever walk the streets again. And even though Vanessa Coleman may, I doubt that she's gonna be a very popular human being when she does get out, if she gets out. Remember, parole board is very, very strict in the States. And actually, the more I read about parole boards, the more I realize that it's very, very rare that people get to leave prison any earlier than they're meant to. In the States, it is hardcore when it comes down to the law. I think the most important thing in this case is to remember two young human beings in love beginning the rest of their lives together. That was how it was meant to be. Two upstanding members of their community, two much loved, adored children, two young adults falling madly, deeply in love with one another, ending their lives, yes, in such an absolutely brutal, horrific, torturous way, but spending their lives loved fully, completely, and without doubt, remembered with that love and true, true embracing of that human spirit that they both embodied. And I think that that's something that those perpetrators will never know how to experience. I don't believe that any of those perpetrators can truly understand what it's like to be fully cherished as Christopher and Channon truly were. And that's sad that those individuals will never experience it. But nonetheless, doesn't give them an excuse to do the heinous, horrific things that they did on those days. It's a tragedy beyond belief. Like I said, it's been a long one because I think there's some really interesting twists and turns in the case. And also because I just wanna diligently do justice to the family of the victims to make sure that I show you just how heinous the last hours of their children's lives were, and also how justice has been, at least pretty much on the whole there, served. Thanks for joining me. I will be releasing content as I always do. So if you like this channel and you haven't subscribed, well, you know where the subscription thing is. Just go and do it now. Do it now. I also have a Patreon, as you know. I hope you've joined me for live chat. If not, and you're watching this at a later date, why not try it next time? I premiere every Wednesday and Sunday, and it's really good for an hour. I'm always there. Join me then.